Well, let's continue the conversation and bring into it right now Sarah Clark. She is a lawyer representing the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, a co-complainant in this case. Sarah, good to see you again. Good to see you, Michael. Listen, I want to begin with your reaction to this go-ahead issued by the courts today. How important is this step for the people who will be compensated? Well, this is huge, Michael. As uh, you've probably reported on already, this is going to be the biggest settlement in Canadian history. Um, and of course, it all stems with the violation of the human rights of First Nations children and their families. So to have that discrimination and that racism recognized in the context of a class action, I think is really important. Well, you know, you, you raise a human rights issue, and of course it was the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, uh, the first federal body that said Canada needs to compensate First Nations children who are put into care. Uh, the government fought that order, eventually lost, obviously, as uh, we are here today. But what lessons do you hope Ottawa will take from this case? Well, I think that... The number one lesson is, why is this number so big? The number is so big because the discrimination went on and on for years and decades when there were advocates across the country calling for the government to stop discriminating against children and their families. So hopefully the lesson learned here is that when people are calling out with evidence and with reason and with common sense, asking for dignity and respect, that the government will listen and that we don't repeat this type of behavior again. So that is what you hope comes out today. But of course, this has been ongoing for years. There have been discussions, negotiations behind closed doors. Do you think that there, that at this point there are people in the federal government that do know that lesson and are hoping to run with that lesson? I think that's possible, um, but it doesn't really matter what people's intentions are inside the government. What we need to see is action. Uh, as you likely know, the human rights complaint remains ongoing. We don't yet have a long-term reform uh, package to actually undo the discrimination and prevent it from recurring. So there's still a lot of work to do in the future. Uh, that shouldn't take away from today's big win for all of the victims in this case. This is monumental for them. I think it's a recognition of the harm that they've endured. But we have to keep moving forward and we have to make sure that the discrimination ends. Now, the settlement uh, also calls on the Prime Minister to apologize on behalf of Canada for the underfunding, the subsequent impacts that the underfunding created. Uh, there seems to be a debate on whether or not that apology should proceed right now. What's your thought on it? So from the Caring Society's perspective, I think the concern is that a public apology uh, is not really the time now. The time now is not for a public apology. When someone apologizes, it's normally because they've done something uh, that was wrong and they're not going to do it again. We're not at a place yet, Michael, where the discrimination against First Nations children and their family has come to an end. I don't think that that should take away, though, from the invitation for the Prime Minister to personally apologize to every single representative plaintiff in this action. I think those folks are likely entitled to his time uh, and his attention. But to publicly apologize for the discrimination in this case is tricky to do right now when there are children today who are still experiencing that very same discrimination. So $23 billion set aside for the compensation, an additional $20 billion uh, earmarked to, to address ongoing issues within uh, child family uh, welfare uh, services. Uh, what do you hope happens with that money? Where would you like this to go? I think from the Caring Society's perspective, that money has to be directed at evidence-informed solutions to the continued overrepresentation of First Nations child, uh, children in the child welfare system, as well as ensuring that children under Jordan's principle receive the services, products, and supports that they deserve, that they're entitled to, and that they need. And we know that those problems are not yet fixed, and they can't just be fixed with money. The government has to make a real commitment to restructuring uh, the Child Welfare Services Program, as well as ensuring that Jordan's principle, as a legal principle, is implemented in a way that respects the rights of children. So money is important, but actually the structure is very important. And that's really where the parties have to continue their ongoing discussions and their ongoing work. Sarah Clark, always appreciate the time and the insight. Thank you for tonight. Thanks, Michael.